We read from the Word of God as we find it in 1 Samuel chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, the text that the Lord has given to us this morning at the request of the parents of the last verses of this chapter. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramath Aim Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroho, Jero, Jerohoam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was, come, was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And he, she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How, wilt, how long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, Nay, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid as a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about, after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. 
So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought them unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed. And the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. And now notice this next verse. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoiced in thy salvation. We stop in our reading of the Word of God there. The text that God gives to all of us this morning is the last two verses of 1 Samuel 1, verses 27 and 28. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. Hannah lent him, gave him, returned him to the Lord in the tabernacle. As Hannah did that, so do we. And even though Brad and Caitlin don't have a boy, but a girl, they too, this morning, vowed to return her to the Lord. In this sense, that they want to train her. They vow and promise to train her in such a way that she will learn, as Samuel did, that her life, is to be one in the service of her God. That she's not her own. Not to do what she wants, but to do what he wants all the days of her life. A meditation written by the Reverend Garrett Voss in 1963, on these verses, was put into the periodical, the Standard Bearer. His specific request and idea of this, the use of this passage was that there would be sons raised in the church who parents would pray, would be used in the ministry of the word. At that time, seven of the 19 congregations in the Protestant Reformed Churches in America were without pastors. Seven of the 19. The article was reprinted in 1997 when three of the 27 congregations were without pastors. It can be printed again today. A child asked for and lent to. That's our theme. And the interesting part is that the word that Hannah uses, lent to, is the very same word that's translated asked for. Samuel's name means asked for. That word, though it's most often translated asked, also means to return what's been asked. And that's interesting. There's a play on words there. She asked for and she returned what she asked for. Same word as the name Samuel. We look at the setting first. 
Then we look at the vow. And thirdly, we look at the fruit that God gives in the text. First is the setting. There are three parts to the setting. The first is the larger setting. And the larger setting is presented as a time of the judges. The time of the judges was a spiritual low in the history of the children of Israel. And if it was up and down at times, and there were judges that were located in different parts of the 12 tribes, dealing with and helping only a portion of the, tri of, of the nation of Israel, the history here concerns the whole of the nation. And that's obvious because the tabernacle is at Shiloh, and that's the center of the whole of the nation. And if the time of the judges was characterized by the harsh, critical expression, everyone did that which was right in their own eyes, and by the sad expression, generations arose which knew not the Lord, nor the works that he had done, then that history can also be understood correctly to be a time when who's taking the sacrifices as the high priests but the very, very evil sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas. The state of the church of that day was extremely low. And that was a concern of Hannah. Hannah was concerned for the body of Jesus Christ, though Christ was yet to come. Hannah was concerned for the church and her spiritual low estate. The second setting is this family. Elkanah. So that just as Lamech, the seventh from Can Adam through Cain, took to himself two wives, so Elkanah takes to himself self, two wives, not following the will of the Lord, not content with a first wife who's barren but wants more than what God gives. A man who is likely to be described as very weak spiritually. He knows the duty and he performs the external duty of going to the, to the tabernacle yearly for the Passover feast. He's doing right things. But in his relationship and in his love for Hannah, he's very earthly and carnal. Am not I better than ten sons? Why can't you be happy with that? Why are you still sad? His second wife, Peninnah, as we read the song of Hannah in chapter 2, can only be identified as someone who was very wicked. We need not judge whether she was saved. It seems from the words of Hannah that she was not only an enemy of Hannah, but an enemy of the Lord too. But we, we will look only at what are pointed out as her sins. Secondly, when we look at that history of the family, then we have to deal with this question about no children. In the old dispensation, that was a sign. Underline that word. In your minds, underline that word. A sign. Always remember that there's a difference between a sign and the reality. 
You have a sign with an arrow turning to the right as you drive down the road. That tells you about a reality. It's not the reality itself. It's a sign. In Deuteronomy 28, blessings, cursings, Moses speaks as he wraps up his final speech to the nation. And as he addresses the nation, he speaks of blessings to the nation by saying to them, Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. And cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field, and cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. First, it was a sign to the nation. Few children. A sign of God's curse on the nation. Many children, a sign in the old dispensation of God's blessing. But now look at this more carefully. In that dispensation of types and shadows, it was something that was greatly desired to have a child by the families, the godly families in Israel. Because, one, there was the hope on the part of the mothers that they might be the mother of the seed of the woman. First promise of salvation. There was also the desire on the part of the mothers that they would be the mother of a child of Abraham, the seed of Abraham. But more importantly, the general national blessing was because they wanted to be able to have continuation in the land of Canaan. They wanted their name on the roll in the land of Canaan. Canaan is a sign of heaven. So just as they could have a place in the land of Canaan, and a name there in their generations, so they would be able to have a picture of their place in heaven. Picture. A sign. Emphasize that. Because we don't want to say, and may not say, that anyone, anyone who has no children is cursed, and anyone who has children is blessed. God doesn't give his favor and show his favor that way. We may say of Brad and Caitlin that they were not blessed of God throughout the early years of their marriage, and now finally they're blessed. We wouldn't look at someone else who has no children and say, cursed, and look out in the world and say, they got a lot of children, they must be blessed. A sign, a picture, not the reality. Not the reality. Make that distinction and clear before you. Because when we look at this general history, we're going to have to say, especially about the view of Penina, that that was her position, her wrong position. Penina said, many children, I am blessed. Hannah, you must be cursed. That was her conclusion. And that was the nature of her cruel, evil conclusions and talk. She taunted Hannah with that thought. That's not uncommon. Not uncommon today either. That we slip into that way of thinking. Job did it. Eliphaz really pushed that thought. If you have much, 
God blesses you and he loves you, you have little or none, then God, you must have a problem, Job. And Job bought into that. And that was Job's greatest sin in the whole of the book of Job. He bought into the fact that he was righteous, so why should God curse him? And he was wrong. And Elihu, finally, and God in the whirlwind had to teach him that. Hannah heard those tauntings. They affected her. She wondered. But don't ever forget that as Hannah was wondering about her own self personally, at the very same time, Hannah had a greater concern. That's very obvious. Her concern was out of a great love and devotion for God. That's evident in the song. Listen to that song. Read it this noon if you want from 1 Samuel 2. Listen to that song of Hannah. She was concerned about the Lord and the Lord's work in Israel. Her first concern was Jehovah. Her second concern was the nation. The nation. She was aware of the spiritual ineptitude of many homes and families. She was concerned about the spiritual laziness and lethargy that characterized Israel at that time. She was concerned about it, Hophni and Phinehas serving as the high priests at that day. Still did her duty with Elkanah, still fulfilled her responsibilities, still went there, and even brought her son into that place where Hophni and Phinehas were the leaders. No, no other place. No other options in that day. And then her grief and sorrow was increased by the language and the attitude of Peninnah. And she looked at herself as not graced, but cursed. And again, a play on words. She looked at herself as not graced. That's what Hannah means. Hannah is graced. Graced of Jehovah. And she took a sign, and periodically she had to keep telling herself, but her feelings kept saying, I must be cursed and not graced. The nearest setting is a Passover feast where her grief concerning the nation and herself flows out. Prayed, just her mouth, moving, looks to be drunken to Eli. But her prayer, her prayer is specific. She is not asking for a child. She wants a son. She asks for a son, a specific kind of son. Pretty demanding. Lord, give me a son. Give me that kind of a son which can serve in the tabernacle, which can serve the church. Serve in the body. Brought up with a mindset of giving himself, not to our land, not to our family name, not to help in the toil of the field and the property, but we're going to give him up. He's going to serve the nation as a whole in the tabernacle. She prayed. That's right. She prayed. Our weakness and our inability is usually the reason why God gives us 
that weakness and inabilities. So we do what he wants us to do. He brings us crosses and trials so we will look outside of ourselves, away from that which is so natural for all of us. We look to our own ability and we look outside of ourselves and we look up to him who alone is able to open or to close. She prayed. She prayed fervently. And she prayed for this child. This kind of a child. And again, that can only be because Hannah's concern was not, I want to meet some satisfactions. I want to be able to, to have my mother instincts be fulfilled and satisfied. And I want a child who can make me proud or a grandchild. I can say, do you see who that is? That's my grandchild who did that. None of that. She gave him up. She returned him. It wasn't about herself in any way. This child was a child who would not serve her, but the church. She wanted a sign of God's blessing on the people, not so that she could be vindicated and justified before Penina. It wasn't about her. And that's what gave rise to her vow. And that we consider now. She vowed unto Jehovah to give him up all the days of his life for as long as he has breath. Wait a minute. And as soon as possible, all the days of his life. Not, well, we'll have them for a while and then when they get married, I guess we have to give them up. No. Her vow was all the days of his life as long as he liveth, he shall be lent to Jehovah. And again, now remember that word lent is the same idea as the word asked. She wanted him to be useful in the service of Jehovah. But now notice very carefully and very quickly. You want to serve the Lord. There's only one way always to do that. Always. This is every generation. And every dispensation. You want to serve the Lord? That means you serve the rest of the body. You serve the church. You serve each other. You serve every other member. To serve the Lord isn't something special we do when we come to church and, and sit in a building that's dedicated for the worship of Him and now I'm going to serve Him. No, you served Him when you got up and it was how you greeted each other this morning. How would you do that? With a grunt? How about cereal boxes? Don't talk to me too early. Mm. Hooded sweatshirts. How'd you deal with each other in the cars coming here? You serve Jehovah, you serve each other. The first and great commandment is you love him. And the other side of the coin inseparable from the love of Jehovah is the love of your brothers and sisters. Every single one of them. That you're not going to judge as liberal or conservative, but you're going to see them as covered in the blood of Christ. Period. Because the second commandment, like to the first, is you love your neighbor. And 1 John 4 says, not only we love him because he first loved us, but you are a liar if you say you love him and you don't. You got grudges. And you got suspicions. You've got attitudes 
about fellow saints in the church of Jesus Christ. You're a liar to say you love God. So to serve Him is consciously raised to serve each other. Sometimes it's the Lord's will that there be only one in a family. Many times God puts many others in the family. And he says, this is the greenhouse of the church that I want you to be raised in. Because I want you to learn how to work with and serve each other. That's a tremendous sidelight and benefit of the school where we got, get together to learn how to care for and serve others. Not to beat, not to be the best, not to show up, not clicks, not separations, but service. So in the home, how do you get along with each other, brothers and sisters? That's how you're going to learn to serve Jehovah. Hannah's vow. She wanted a child who would be used for the service of the church. As soon as he was weaned, as soon as he no longer needed his mother's milk, while he was drinking from her breast, she was teaching him you're not your own, Samuel. She wanted him when he left her and she brought him to Hophni and Phinehas and Eli that she would say, go willingly. Now, he wasn't perfectly willing. He was normal. But for the most part, she, he wanted him trained so he was willing to leave his beloved mother. And he would do that because inside of him, God had answered her prayers for this child. One who would see it to be his calling to serve, to give himself up for the sake of the other parts of the body. That's the kind of prayer that Hannah prayed. Judging, judging others by myself. I know that when you were first married, you wanted a child for self. Just as when we find out that we're pregnant and, and there's a child conceived, our focus isn't on their need for regeneration, but we want their health. That's... that's that's our natures. That's us. But we're going to learn now. We're going to learn. We're going to be taught of the Lord that just as Brindley needs a new heart and Isaiah needs a new heart and every child needs a new heart. So it's more than that. Not just a regenerated heart, but a heart that influences the mind to see oneself as living in order to serve. To teach the way of Jehovah. To do justice and judgment. That's why God gave to Abraham the promise that the covenant would be with him and that covenant would be with his seed in their generations. Because God said, I know him, and I have known him, in order that he would teach his household the way of Jehovah to do justice and judgment. Penina says, the fruit of my body is mine. I did it. It's what I worked for. I gave myself up in all of my slimness just to carry this child. I gave a lot up for this child. And I'm up at night, not wanting to be, but I'll do it for this child. I give myself up. 
This is mine. What hast thou that thou hast not been given? What do you have that you stand before him and say, it was a gift, and it's still a gift? Every ability, every talent, every good deed is a gift. And I have to give it back. And he will, he will require that of me one day. How did you do in giving it back, in returning what he gave? Graced believers see their children as gifts always belonging to the giver. Not disgracing themselves when they run across the court at halftime, but when they disgrace him by attitudes of selfishness. That's what we pray for. So every day we give him back, and every day we pray. Hannah never stopped praying. She got the child, but she never stopped praying. She never stopped praying fervently that God would work in that child everything she wanted it to know and to learn. Because she could set it before the child and she could tell the child, but she couldn't put it in his heart. She couldn't give him that kind of devotion, that kind of an attitude. She was praying against his human nature. So she prayed because she couldn't break that human nature, but she knew who could. And so she kept praying. And after she left him, she prayed. And she kept praying. You are here, Samuel, not to do what you want. Brindley, you little beautiful thing, you are not here to do what you want. Right now, she lets you know what she wants. But to guide her and to teach her. That she loved him. And that her gratitude for what he's done for her will move her to love him back. That was the result. Samuel went, even as a little child, look at there. How old was he when he was weaned? We, we don't know the exact age pretty young and you know what he did look at the end of the last part of verse 28 he worshiped Jehovah there he saw the beauty of Jehovah he delighted in Jehovah in all of his goodness he praised him as the self-sufficient one the self-sustaining one she honored him he was going to serve Jehovah and he called upon him for all of his worthiness. He recounted God's worthiness one deed after another and he laid that before Jehovah. He wanted to honor the Lord that way and Samuel became that kind of a person. He never stopped worshiping Jehovah. What is interesting about Samuel is that he judged Israel and he used his sons to judge Israel. But the Lord marks Samuel a little differently than we do. Samuel judged the whole of the nation as far as he could go. He made a circuit throughout all of Israel, all the 12, ten, 12 tribes. But Psalm 99, verse 6, and Jeremiah 15, verse 1, little-known verses, puts Samuel's name 
right next to that of Moses and equates them in their intercessory work for Israel. Moses' intercessory work is identified in the book of Exodus and Numbers. He did this. When Israel was going to be destroyed by Jehovah, he prayed. He prayed fervently. He had reasons that he could justify his prayer before the Lord. Lord, you should bless them. You must bless them. You must not destroy them. He interceded for Israel over and over. So did Samuel. Just like Moses. He prayed for the church. He was a churchman. You don't have to be a minister or an office bearer to be a church person. You can be a church person as a mother in Israel who herself serves, who teaches any child that the Lord may give to her to serve by serving everybody around them that God puts in their path. By praying for one another. Praying for Ben and Becky, their soul, as they struggle with every day watching a little child that they're so helpless to do anything about. Praying. Pray for one another. That's the way to serve concretely express. Don't just say, I've been praying for you. Say what you want to pray about. Be specific. What do you want God to do? And lay it before Him over and over. Samuel asked of God, returned to God, prayed for Israel. And that was Hannah's joy so that she could say those words, My heart rejoiceth in Jehovah. Her joy was that God was going to perform a work and did perform a work in the church. Baptism. Next week, Lord's Supper. He performed a work in Jesus Christ. And her joy in Jehovah was exactly because of that work in Christ. Forgiving, washing, declaring us righteous. She saw and could rejoice because she saw God's answer to her prayer. Remember, graced, that's her name. But grace means I never deserve it. And I'm still loved. Undeserved favor. I'm loved, though I don't deserve it. So when God blessed in this way, see, be careful, God blesses by not saving and God blesses by saving. His people receive blessing constantly in every situation. Don't just talk about some blessings without knowing that the opposite for the child of God is just as much a blessing, if not more. We don't believe in common grace. We believe in particular grace. And those who get that grace get it all the time. But it's never earned. So as she stood before Jehovah, and she rejoiced in him, and she saw Samuel doing his work, serving, she knew she was still Hannah, given what she didn't deserve. And that's why her joy and her thanks was constant and will be forever. May that be ours. Gifted. Gifted. Return. So that she will learn what it means that she's not her own. May we all learn again Amen. Our Father, we honor and thank Thee for the great gift that Thou hast given in Jesus Christ. 
so that all things, barren and fruitful, are good, great, wonderful good. Teach us that we cannot see thy favor in things, but in Christ and in Christ alone. Amen.